Well, good morning, Park Plaza. It is good to come to all three of our branches today, Jinx, Brookside, and Central. I'm glad to come to you today by way of video, and thank you for allowing me to do this. This past week has been a little bit uh, hectic for me, and being in God's Word, or at least having one more reason to be in God's Word, in the sermon preparation has afforded me a great deal of peace this week. So thank you for putting up with the screen, and thank you for letting me come to you by way of video. I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank the entire church for your support. Support for my wife, my kids, my mom who's been with us this past week, and, and your support for me. Uh, whether it's been text, email, phone calls, uh, regular Facebook, or the Caring Bridge on Facebook, uh, my apologies that I've not been able to communicate and get back with all of you, but uh, it, it has been overwhelming, the support that you have uh, afforded us in prayer mainly. Uh, that is the number one thing we appreciate, but also just uh, the notes of encouragement, the pats on the back. Thank you so very much. I can say more than ever today, Psalm 118, with a good heart, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I am rejoicing, and I am glad in it. Speaking of a family uh, supporting one another in spiritual matters, a young father was committed to supporting his four-year-old son in his early faith development. He had been praying with his son, he'd been reading the Bible to his son all through his early four years. And it did the father's heart a lot of good one day when he was driving his sons in the back seat thinks his son has dozed off and comes this fragile little voice that says, Dad, how do you spell God? Oh, and the, the dad's heart. I mean, it just swells with pride and just, he's, he's so excited. His son is growing in spiritual matters. How do you spell God? And he, he says, well, son, you, you spell God G-O-D, to which the reply was, thanks, Dad. Now, how do you spell Zilla? You know, there are times when those around us don't exactly deem as important the things that we find important. It's at this time of year that we really begin to see what others do find important, uh, whether it's in their resolutions through health, finances, a recommitment to God's Word, uh, what they're going to be about in this next year with their family, we begin to see what others around us really find of value. It's that time of year where we take something from our losing column, something that's lagging behind in our lives, and we move it into the win column. We want to redouble our efforts in that area. This morning as we come to God's Word, we encounter Jesus as He collides with one that had a lot of check marks in the win column. In fact, if there was a winner in the Bible... This guy was it. Jesus today, as we encounter His Word, is in a full-on collision with what the world would call a big-time winner. He's young, he's rich, he's a respected man of authority. In fact, in this passage, he's even asking about spiritual matters. You know, I would guess if you were a, a father who was sending your daughter off to college and you got a phone call that your daughter was dating this kind of guy. He had a financial savvy about him. He was asking about spiritual things. He was a respected leader on campus. He was one who was well-spoken, a leader in the community. I mean, this is the kind of guy, if he's, if he's dating your daughter, you might do a backflip. Well, that's how it appears at first. But as we come to Luke chapter 18, verse 18... There's something else going on here. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, as we look at Jesus' collision with this big-time winner, turn to Luke 18 and verse 18. Today we begin a short three-week series that I've titled, Last. And there are several passages in the Bible where Jesus defines what it is to really be great, what it really is to get ahead. And well, we're going to encounter one of those passages this morning as we begin this series. Luke 18 and verse 18. A certain ruler asked Jesus, a Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. 
No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything. Everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? To which Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Here we encounter in Scripture the only individual who's ever noted for leaving Jesus with a downcast face. He comes, you can kind of picture it, he's got this certain air about him. So many things, so many wins are going on in his life. Let's just add to those that in the spiritual category. And by the time Jesus is done, that air, that savvy, it's gone. He leaves with a downcast face. This morning, I've got a very important question to ask you as we begin a new year. I've got a very important question for you as you continue to follow after God. And this is it. How much do you want to be like Jesus? Now, you can be a Christian, as our culture now defines a Christian, and not be at all like Jesus. And so the question remains... How much do you really want to be like Jesus? To be like Jesus, you have to lose. Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and 45. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, whoever wants to gain his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will in fact save it. Our first point this morning, if you're following along on the back of your handout in the sermon outline, is this. Jesus calls you, Jesus calls all of us that follow after Him to be a loser. Now that's hard to hear in a culture that loves winners. We've now worked out with our little kids when they play sports that everyone gets trophies. In business, we love a win-win situation. In fact, one of the largest and fastest growing blocks of voters in our nation is a group that really doesn't care what the candidate is for. They just wait until they can figure out who is going to win and they vote for the winning candidate so they can be on the winning side. It's preposterous. But we live in a culture that loves a winner. And so when Jesus calls us to be losers, that's a hard message to hear. Philippians chapter 2, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but He made Himself nothing. And it's not just something that we have to consider once or every now and then, It's something that we have to continue to consider. In Mark chapter 9, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus calls the twelve and says, Be a servant to all. 
If you want to be first, be last. So that's at the beginning of Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry here on earth. Well, he gets it very clear at the very beginning. But three-and-a-half years later, in Luke chapter 22, these same disciples are now arguing about who's going to be the head honcho. Who gets to be the biggest winner in the kingdom that is to come? It's not just something that we have to consider, but something that we consider, something that we carry in our cross daily in what it is to be a loser and lose for Christ. Now, there's one key thing. Now, hear this this morning, church. Whether you're Brookside, Jinx, or Central 8.30 or 11 o'clock, or whether you're listening online, this really is a key part of being the loser that Christ calls us to be. The key aspect and the key thing to keep in mind is, is that in this world, everyone is a loser. There are those who lose sleep so that they'll pick up a degree. There are those who lose sweets so that they'll gain health. There are those that lose a little bit of downtime in front of the TV just doing nothing so that they can pick up a a talent, perhaps uh, play an instrument, play the piano. There are those that lose the promotion or lose the raise or lose the corner office at work so that they can gain time with family. There are those that lose an argument so they can gain a friendship. There are those of us that choose to lose something so that we gain something. Gaining and winning anything significant in life is choosing to lose something. Which brings up the next question. Are you deciding well in this life? Now the first question was, how much do you want to be like Jesus? The second question is just as important. Are you deciding well in this life what you're choosing to gain and what you're losing to gain that? Brings up our second point this morning. In asking the question, are you deciding well? Jesus calls you to examine your priorities. And the best way that you can examine your priorities is examine what your life is about now with the end in mind. Psalm 90 in verse 12, of the 150 Psalms, the only one that's ascribed to Moses. Great deal of wisdom here. Psalm 90 and 12, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's something to be said about examining examining our priorities with the end in mind. You know, each of us lives in the tension between two visions. Two visions that the printed word, if I can, bring before us. The first vision is the printed word of of magazines. If you were to thumb through some magazines today, take a look at the pictures, read the articles in between. These magazines will tell you this is what it is to have the good life. The ads tell us this is the car, Uh, these are the clothes, this is the home or the second home, this is the vacation, this is what it is to have the good life. Now there's another printed piece of word that we live between in this world. The magazines on the one hand and the other and living with the end in mind is our obituary. The day will come where someone will speak over us. And they're not going to talk about our cars. They're not going to talk about our clothes. They're not going to talk about the size of our home or how many bedrooms were there. They're not going to talk about a second home. And they're not going to be talking about the good life that the world is after. But we want them to talk about the good person that we were about the business of trying to be in Christ. And we live in that tension today, whether it's the good life we're going to pursue or the good person that God calls us to be about the business of becoming because of Him. Today, let us examine our priorities with the end in mind. 
Now, none of us likes to feel like we're losing in this tension. Because to move towards being a good person and move away from what the world calls the good life, sometimes we feel like we're losing. We, we may feel like uh, we're losing some of our young ladies, losing a boyfriend. Because as God calls them and living with the end in mind, that they're about the business of sexual purity. And so they feel like they're, they're losing something of what the magazines would say, this is what is important. There's some who will lose a friend because they won't go out on Friday night or Saturday night and do what others do. There are some who feel like they're losing when they're not cheating on taxes. Everyone else is getting away with it. There are some in, in school and college who feel like they're losing because they, they know their classmates have been about an unethical practice in plagiarizing papers, cheating on tests, and now they feel like they're losing. There are some families who feel like they're losing when their son or daughter drop in the rotation on the team. Because for them, Sundays are a priority to be with the family of God. And they're not out at the ball fields. And so because they've made a choice in examining their priorities, that they feel like they're losing. And there are times as we examine our priorities and that we feel like we're losing, we're not our best person. We're not exactly feeling good about this, the way this world is going. Reminds me of a story of an older, retired man. He and his wife liked to sleep in a little bit, and as school in the fall was getting back underway, a group of boys headed out to school every morning early. And they made it their practice every morning to make sure that every metal trash can in the alley behind this couple's home was just beat to death. I mean, they were playing the drums, they were kicking the cans, throwing rocks at them, waking up everyone for blocks around. Well, the man went out the second morning and watched these kids, and by getting a, a good look at them, he knew it was going to do no good at all to ask these boys to stop. In fact, that would probably just get them going all the more and beating these cans to death. And so on the third day, the man went out, and he said, You know, young man, you're doing me a huge favor. I've got some crows around here in my garden, and as you're beating these cans to death where everyone can hear it, the, the crows are flying away, and I'd love to pay you for what you're doing. I'm going to pay each of you a dollar a week if you'll just beat the fire out of these cans. And the boys were thrilled with it. Man, this, this, was, this was incredible, about eight of them, and man, this is going to be good, easy money. We're doing this anyway. And so that next day, they just beat the cans, and for a week they beat them, they got their dollar. Second week, they beat them, they got their dollar, each and every one of them. Third week, a man went out and he said, Guys, I've taken a little bit of hit in my retirement plan. The, the economy's down a little bit, the stock market's down, and I might have to cut back to 50 cents a week for beating these cans. The young men, they, they weren't that happy, but they, they agreed. Well, another week went by, and the man went out, and he said, Guys, I've got to tell you something. I, I've just, some unexpected costs have come up, and I've got to cut it down to 25 cents a week for, for beating these cans. To which the leader of the young men said, If you think we're going to beat these cans for 25 cents a week, you've got another thing coming. We're never going to hit them again. There's a little bit of wisdom there. But the point of that story is this. There are times in life where we forget why we're doing what we're doing. We forget that there may be someone on the other end that has a reward in store. We forget why we got into the business of following Christ. We forget who's watching us. We forget who's participating and what He's promised for those of us who are faithful. This morning when we feel like we're losing... This morning when we feel like we're about the business of doing something and the world just keeps cheating us or we keep missing what we deem our efforts are worth. There's a third point this morning Jesus wants you to understand and it's all throughout the Bible. Number three, Jesus claims that the kingdom is worth it. When you live up for Him, when you stay up to His call, when you examine your priorities and you make a decision as an individual, as a couple, as a family, to live for Him and lose what this world says is of value, 
You decide to put the good life that the world says you need to have on not just the back burner, but out of sight and out of mind. And you decide to focus on being the good, godly person God has called you to be. And there are times where Satan speaks into your ears and he says, man, you're missing it. You're losing it. The one shot you've got at this life, you've banked on the wrong thing. Jesus comes back and his claim is this, that the kingdom is worth it. Matthew 13 and 44, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Paul would say to the church in Philippi, chapter 3 and verse 7, But whatever was to my gain, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. You know, this past week, I've had an opportunity to re-examine my priorities. I've had an opportunity to really, really pray about and really get down to the question of how much do I want to be like Jesus in this moment of trial? How much do I want my life to count for the things that Christ would have it count for? And Satan's great ploy in all of our lives is for him to lead us into a process of focusing in on what we're losing instead of what we're gaining in Christ. With the story of the rich young ruler, what Jesus viewed as the greatest of blessings, the rich young ruler viewed as the greatest of burdens. Today, God is calling you to be a loser. He is calling you to examine the question, are you deciding well in this life? You're losing something and you're gaining something every day. The question is, are you gaining Christ? Are you gaining the things that He would have you gain in this life? And are you losing the things that He is begging you by His example to lose? You say, wait a minute, He's not just calling us to be a loser. He provided us an example of being a loser. You bet He did. Philippians 2 says that, and the entire gospel says that. Because Jesus never calls you to make a decision that He did not make Himself. At Gethsemane, He made the same decision. He lost His life to gain you. This morning, will you be one who loses your life to gain Him? How much do you want to be like Jesus? And that question directly leads into, how much do you want to be with Jesus today? And with the end in mind, one day. This morning, perhaps it's not just a time to make a New Year's resolution, but it's time to make a New Year's repentance. It's time to come back. Maybe you'll do it in the pew you sit in and in your heart of hearts with your spouse, with a friend, with an accountability partner. You will be one that re-examines your priorities and you desperately commit to being about the business with God's grace and His Holy Spirit to being like Jesus. Perhaps today you want to come forward. There will be elders down front that will receive you and are wanting to pray for you. This church is wanting to pray for you. Is today we come back and say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be with Jesus in the process of losing so that I can save my very life. Today perhaps you want to come as one has already come this past week and given their life to Christ in baptism. If any of these things, would you come now as we stand and as we sing?